kind of what you know, Jeremy characterized. Yeah. It tells you that they, they sort of screwed up quantitatively. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to our event. Uh, I'm Will Adler, and this is a uh, event by the Scientist Action and Advocacy Network. This is a group that I uh, and a bunch of other people in the room started after the election to figure out how we as scientists could uh, connect with social justice organizations that are doing uh, really good work and share our research skills and our analytical skills, and you're going to hear from uh, some of those organizations today. So it's not a big focus of the event that we're going to do, uh, that we're about to have, but you are going to hear a little bit about the specific work that we've been doing. And if this seems like the kind of thing that's interesting to you and you want to get involved, whether you're a scientist or not, whether you're from NYU or not, uh, we'd love to have you on board. We meet every other Monday in this room at 6 p.m., so our next meeting is in two weeks. You can find more info about what we're doing on our website, which is scan.net, that's scan with two A's. And if you have any more questions, you can get in touch with us through the form, or you can uh, find me afterwards. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start uh, with our first speaker, it's gonna be Jen Laura Lee, who is a SCAN member and the project lead on our collaboration with Raise the Age. She's gonna talk a little bit about what we've been doing with Raise the Age. And uh, then I'm gonna introduce our four guest speakers. And following that, we're gonna have a uh, panel discussion moderated by Sylvia, who's also a SCAN member, and uh, she's also going to take some audience questions, so please just hold your questions until the end. Uh, so with that, let's uh, welcome Jen. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming out. Um, basically, I'm just going to highlight what we've done in the last few months um, since we will actually start this SCAN organization. Essentially, we're just a bunch of graduate students and some professors who got together after the election and wanted to know how we can make an impact, um, an impact given our like current training and our current resources. As graduate students who are involved in academic and involved in research, we wanted to see like how um, issues proximal to our field of neuroscience and psychology could um, we could like make the most of our uh, expertise in that. Um, and so we came up with this idea of collaborating with these wonderful people at Raise the Age. Raise the Age is a non-governmental organization. They were essentially putting forward legislation um, which aims to raise the age of criminal responsibility from 16 to 18 years old. So uh, as I'm sure Steph and Beth are gonna cover in extensive detail, um, just as a general overview, up until very recently, North Carolina and New York were the only two states in which children of 16 and 17 years of age could be tried as adults in courts of law, and they could be actually put into adult jails and adult prisons. So you'd have 16 and 17 year olds um, at places like Rikers. Um, and just very recently, thanks to their wonderful work, um, a law has been a bill has been passed which um, basically makes sure that these kids are actually treated up in an age appropriate facility, and um, it makes them have to be essentially be treated in, in juvenile centers as opposed to adult prisons and jails. Um, and so uh, part of what we did for them was that we brought together 26 um, different uh, journal articles into one nice summary that we thought was accessible to the general public. And so it's a scientific uh, summary of, of various different psychology and neuroscience papers which give evidence essentially to lawmakers and to policymakers as to why 16 and 17 year olds are not at all um, like it's not a suitable thing for them to be put in adult jails, and moreover, how their brains are still malleable, they're still highly plastic, um, and therefore we should be using more like uh, restorative approaches and rehabilitative approaches as opposed to um, like just regular punishment. And so, I'm going to go over like the uh, the report that we've done and also highlight some of the, the how we did it in, in case you guys are scientists who are thinking about joining SCAD, um, you can maybe take a look at like basically. How, how the process works and how you can use your scientific skills, learn something along the way as well, and also make somewhat of an impact. <laughs> okay, so I kind of went into the, the details of Raise the Age. I gave you the general overview of, they're basically, they were a non <coughs> NGO, which sought to raise the age of criminal responsibility from 16 to 18. Um, and what we did for them was produce this report, which is available on our website if you want to look at scan.net. Um, and it was essentially just called Scientific Support for Raising the Age of Criminal Responsibility. So our arguments were essentially twofold. The first argument was that brain areas involved in decision making and regulation of emotions are not fully developed in adolescence. Um, and this is like an important point to drive home, but not necessarily the most effective approach to take when trying to convince lawmakers. Um, they don't like necessarily uh, the arguments that say that you know, people aren't culpable for their, uh, their actions. 
they oftentimes like interpret these kinds of arguments as, oh, you're just saying that these people aren't guilty, but it's still an important, uh, it's still important ground to cover is to prove that these children really are distinct from adults in very intuitive and like sensible ways. They don't have the ability to regulate their emotions. They're not able to um, think about the future in the same way that adults can. So if you were to ask them, for instance, like, where do you see yourself in 30 years? They can't give you as vivid of an idea because they simply don't know because they're children. Um, moreover, they're, um, they're much worse at suppressing emotional information. Um, they also have differential brain activity in response to threats and rewards. So this obviously changes the, their decision-making processes. Um, and so here are some examples of like figures that we include in our report. And this is like, a lot of this is thanks to Weiji and Will. They took figures from really dense scientific papers that had a lot of text and a lot of numbers, things that were just generally inaccessible to the general public. And they like stripped them of the data and like basically repurposed them for, the, uh, for a report and repackaged them into figures that are very streamlined and like easy, easy for general public members to be able to appreciate and understand what the main point of the figure was. So this is a great example. Um, this is showing brain activity in the orbital frontal cortex um, in response to a fearful stimulus. So in this task, essentially, they had to make a split second decision as to whether or not a face was um, fearful or neutral. And they actually showed differential brain activity in response to fearful faces. and. Um, basically stimuli that would normally make a person anxious or afraid, um, they had a, a very different effect on children as opposed to adults. And so that could be obviously used in intuitive ways to figure out, you know, why is it that children react so differently? Can we really blame them for the things that they, they do um, when they're under a lot of emotional stress? Um, another, another set of great figures that we use in our report, um, again, thanks to Will Adler, who adapted all of these from dense papers, um, was the, the idea that peer influence is something that can really impact a child as opposed to an adult. So um, in, in this particular study, they were using a um, basically like a driving experiment. So they had like this sort of video game uh, driving experiment where kids were able to either um, like try to run this yellow light in order to save time, and obviously you're trying to you know get the highest score possible, um, or you know play it safe and stop at the yellow light and um, you know, if, if you did run the yellow light and got hit, then there would be a, a severe penalty, things like that. It's essentially just like kind of like a gambling game where you're figuring out where your equilibrium lies. Are you more willing to take risks or are you less willing to take risks in order to improve your score? Um, the idea here being that in the presence of peers, so just simply having their friends watch them play this game, children, specifically 16 and 17 year olds, were far more likely to do the risky, the risky move and actually try to run that red light uh, maybe it's to look cool in front of their friends, maybe, like, we'll never really understand, but we do know that these kids definitely take more risks when they're actually around people of the same age group. Um, and that is a very dis differential effect as compared to adults who don't do the same. The effect of pe being watched by their peers doesn't have quite the same risk-taking effect on them. And so these are all really interesting studies that we try to make accessible to the general public through these figures. Um, Moreover, just a general index of resistance to peer pressure. You can see that your ability to resist peer pressure increases steadily up until your 20s and probably even some past that. Um, and so we highlighted this particular age group in question, 16 and 17 year olds, and showed that they're nowhere near the resistance to peer influence level that a 20 year old would have, for instance. And finally, this is a great summary figure by Lawrence Steinberg, um, and it essentially just shows what we all sort of intuitively do know, but quantifies it, which is that um, even though your cognitive abilities might be quite high as a 16 or 17 year old, as measured by things like memory tasks and verbal fluency tasks, um, you can perform very well and almost like adult-like at that level. You're not necessarily emotionally mature, and those things are dissociable, especially during this age group. So emotional maturity would involve things that we just talked about, for instance, peer resistance, future-oriented thinking, impulsivity, and risk comprehension. And all of these different metrics were like really like impaired, let's say, in 16 and 17 year olds. Essentially, they don't have nearly close to adult levels. Um, and so these are all just figures that we use to try to drive home that point that we can't be treating these age groups the same way. Um, but the second argument is like the slightly more hopeful one and also more, the more impactful one um, when it comes to actually what will uh, sort of convince lawmakers and policymakers that something really needs to change in practice, which is that the adolescent brain is in fact quite malleable, and that comes as a two-sided coin. It is more susceptible to trauma, but it's also more amenable to rehabilitation. 
Um, and so both those points are really important to prove quantitatively if we're actually trying to, uh, to make that case in like, for instance, a court of law or a legislative assembly. The first uh, is that trauma, well, this is actually just sort of like a, a social uh, statistic. This has nothing to do with neuroscience. This is just to prove that um, trauma is endemic in adult prisons and jails. So this was actually taken from the New York City Department of Corrections. It's the first report of the Nunez Independent Monitor. So it basically monitored um, all, uh, all correctional facility activity at Rikers from November 1st, 2015 to February 29th, 2015. <coughs> and it showed that the percentage of incarcerated, the percentage of incarcerated individuals who um, experienced physical force by staff um, was like significantly higher for 16 and 17 and 18 year olds as compared to, to children who are to, to prison mates who are 19 and older. So essentially your chance of being physically uh, handled or like um, have, having some kind of physical intervention uh, be done to you by a member or like a staff of the prison was about 27% if you were a 16 or 17 year old which is absolutely crazy. This, the difference in how people are treated based on their age is, is quite remarkable in these prisons and these jails. Um, and what does that mean in terms of neuroscience? Well, we know that from neuroscientific studies, your ability to forget a feel, fearful memory, your ability to completely extinguish that memory is actually much lower, particularly, du particularly during this period of adolescence in that age group of 12 to 17. So while children and adults, adults being people in the age group of 18 to 28, were able to extinguish a fear uh, memory that was no longer relevant. Adolescents have this unique, um, like this unique property that they actually retain that information far, far past when it is like uh, ecologically relevant or behaviorally relevant. If if you condition them to associate some kind of stimulus with something very aversive or fearful, then um, they won't be able to forget that. As opposed to other age groups, which are more likely to be able to forget that. And so, what does this mean? Putting it together. Um, is that we need to really make sure that we're not traumatizing these kids who are being sent to Rikers, who are being sent to prisons. Um, we need to give them like age-appropriate treatment where they're actually uh, being treated as potential victims of previous trauma in their previous lives. And the flip side of that coin, of the plasticity and malleability of the adolescent brain, is that the adolescent brain is extremely amenable to rehabilitation. So because brain architecture is drastically being reshaped, the prefrontal cortex, for instance, has twice as many connections as it does later on in life, and all those connections are essentially like pruned based on your experiences. Um, we think that we, we can actually meaningfully make the argument that uh, the kinds of experiences that you have in your adolescence are extremely formative, and they stay with you for a very long time. They have the potential to be highly impactful on your character as you grow up. And a lot of that has to do with neurological development and simply being able to learn things very quickly. And so because of that, um, we're proposing that rather than having these punitive measures that don't necessarily do any good for children and often just end up traumatizing them further, um, why not just provide them with better alternatives in juvenile facilities that are more reformation, rehabilitation based. Um, so that is essentially the summary of our report. Uh, what we've done today is brought forward uh, a panel of four speakers who are going to help tell us sort of more about the actual age, uh, raise the age bill, um, which is actually passed into law. So they're going to tell us about the implementation of that bill, what it looks like moving forward in terms of how it's actually going to roll out. So we know that there's, for instance, it's going to take about two years in total to complete in its entirety. First, the 16 year olds are going to be um, out of out of adult jails and prisons, and then the next, the following year, I think it'll be the 17 year olds um, that get put into different facilities. So it's not gonna happen all at once, and the implementation of it is kind of slow and tricky. Um, but we're, we're, throughout the panel discussion, we'll also hopefully get a better idea of what scientists can continue to do to support this movement, to monitor juvenile programs, and to ensure that these juvenile programs are trauma-informed and age-appropriate. And then moreover, just more broadly, um, how can academic scientists become more politically engaged in issues that are proximal to their area of study? So for instance, we found that like, in order to try to get these people to come and volunteer for us at SCAN, um, it needed to be somewhat relevant to the skills that they had. So we have a lot of people in our program that are data analysis driven or that make figures pretty much 24-7 um, like in their actual <laughs> jobs. Um, so we, we wanted to like harness these things that were like you know proximal and relevant, especially subject content and, and subject matter that is relevant and proximal to us. We can all read neuroscience and psychology papers. 
Um, and so uh, we want to know how best to apply the skills that we do have. Um, in the process, we can also learn new things. For instance, I learned how to use LaTeX um, to, to format this report really nicely. So essentially, it's kind of like a, a, a positive for everyone. We're able to actually become politically engaged, help the community, but also like learn skills that are going to be relevant to our own careers later on. Um, and so hopefully, we can get a better sense for what kinds of projects we can take on moving forward. Um, also, what the state of uh, affairs is with the raise the age uh, law. Um, so thank you so much for coming out, and hopefully you guys will have great questions with audience members. Okay, sounds good. Um, okay, so next up we have Stephanie and Beth from uh, Raise the Age New York. So let's welcome them to NYU. Hi, my name is Beth Powers. Uh, I'm the director of Youth Justice at the Children's Defense Fund in New York. So. Um, my organization, Children's Defense Fund New York, and Seth Bader Organizations, Women for Children, co-lead the Raise the Age New York campaign. So Raise the Age New York itself is uh, not a separate organization, but rather is a campaign that is led by uh, organizations around the state, um, and uh, our two organizations sort of uh, coordinate that, um, and have for the last four years. So I'm going to start out by just very briefly going into why Raise the Age, why this was our issue, and, and why it was a was an issue for, for kids in New York. So as Jen mentioned, um, prior to the passage of the law, New York and North Carolina were the only two states where young people were automatically prosecuted as adults starting at age 16. So the reason that that is uh, significant, um, every single state has some way that kids under the automatic age of prosecution can be tried as adults um, for more serious crimes. So every single state. But New York was unique, uh, along with North Carolina, because every kid was automatically charged as an adult, regardless of the seriousness of the offense. So in New York, nearly 75% of 16 and 17 year olds were arrested for misdemeanors, but regardless of that, every one of them was prosecuted as an adult. So that means that their parents were not notified when they were arrested, if they made new statements or waived their um, Miranda rights or waived their rights to an attorney, whatever they did, um, their parents weren't necessarily there. Um, if they were held, uh, they would have been held in an adult jail. Um, and if they had bail, it would have been up to them to find a way to make bail. Um, and they were prosecuted in the adult court system, meaning they faced adult sentences um, and adult criminal convictions. So potentially um, at age 16, or not potentially, it happened um, and still happens, 16-year-olds um, charged as adults have criminal convictions that are adult convictions that they, uh, impact them the same way they impact any, anyone at any age. So they could be banned from public housing, they could be denied um, employment opportunities, um, student loan opportunities, um, things like that. Uh, it could impact their immigration status. Um, and so we started the Race the Age New York campaign to address this, to bring New York in line with the rest of the country so that the automatic age of prosecution is not so young. Um, so we launched in 2013 um, and had statewide representation. So we regularly communicate with other folks from the campaign, but this was a statewide issue, and this had to be addressed at the state level. So it was state legislation that we were seeking um, and that we ultimately got. And so we have partners all over the state that were working with us um, to meet with their elected officials, to educate the community, um, to bring folks out in support of raising the age. Um, we had coordinated advocacy um, around the state, so different activities. We would bring folks to Albany. We would also encourage folks to do uh, in-district meetings. Um, we had coordinated go government relations um, strategy and coordinated uh, communication strategy um, throughout the state. Uh, and we just had a consistent presence. Um, we came really close to getting raised the age a couple of times, um, and it just fell off the, fell off the table. Um, there's a lot of competing interests. There's a lot of things that need to be fixed, um, and it just wasn't something that got done until this year. Um, and so uh, we were very, uh, very excited that this this was the year, and um, the age was raised. And uh, it's a really long law, under over 100 pages. <laughs> it's a really uh, lengthy piece of legislation that we summarized in the two pages um, that you have. Uh, and Stephanie's going to go through some of the, the changes. And it's also up on uh, the Raise the New York campaign website, so you can access it there as well. And so I'm just going to talk briefly about the law and some of the future, but before I do that, I just wanted to say um, from our perspective how really um, excited we were when you all reached out to us. Um, 
for years, as we advocated for this law, um, Beth and I, who do not have neuroscience backgrounds, have been arguing um, that the brain about the brain science. And so we met with legislators and um, we talked about how the adolescent brain wasn't fully developed, and we included stuff about the prefrontal cortex in our testimony. Um, and we also claimed that because the brain wasn't fully developed, um, that teenagers were more receptive to treatment. But we really didn't have any backup for anything we were saying, other than we cited Larry Steinberg. But um, we didn't really know what we were talking about, but we were talking about it. Um, <laughs> so we were really excited when people who actually legitimately knew what they were talking about reached out to us to say, you know, we'd love to engage with you. And so, um, you know, we worked up, we, we didn't work on that report, but you all worked on that report. Um, and then we, we used that in our advocacy. We shared it in Albany. Um, you all did great social media. We tried to, you know, we also tried to do social media. Your figures were up on social media. Um, and it was really great. And also, you know, um, I have to say I was almost surprised at first when we first met to review the paper. I thought it was going to be really complicated and something I didn't understand. Um, but you all did such a great job of making it into something that actually the average person could understand. Um, and that's what you need for advocacy if you've ever met with legislators. They're not neuroscientists. <laughs> um, and so um, they under we all understood it, um, and it was really, really great. So I just wanted to start with that um, and say thank you. Um, and then just talk really briefly about the law, because we could, as Beth said, it's 100 pages. We could spend a long time talking about it. Um, but the bottom line is that um, we are currently in the quote unquote planning period. Um, and um, the age will be raised for 16 year olds effective October 1st, 2018. And then for 17 year olds October 1st, 2019. Um, the law requires that no 16 or 17 year old be on Rikers Island after October 1st, 2018. Um, so both the 16 and 17 year olds will need to be off of Rikers Island. Um, by October 2018. Um, we get calls lately about somebody 16 or 17 year old got arrested, what happens? And unfortunately, nothing new happens for now. Um, but the law includes a lot of the things we were advocating for. It's not perfect. It does have compromise in it, but it includes a lot of the things we were asking for, um, starting with parental notification upon arrest um, and involving parents in the decisions and discussions with lawyers and waiving Miranda rights, which as it currently stands, a 16 or 17 year old could be arrested, no parents wouldn't know about it. Um, the overwhelming majority of cases will be heard in the family court. Um, misdemeanors will start in the family court. All of the felonies start in the adult court in the youth part. Um, that is so those who are concerned about raise the age and public safety can say, well, all the felonies start in the adult court. Um, but the nonviolent felonies will presumptively be sent down to family court. Um, they'll be transferred um, unless the district attorney files a motion within 30 days showing extraordinary circumstances as to why the case should stay in the youth part. Um, we don't know what our understanding is. That means most cases will not have extraordinary circumstances, but that's the kind of thing that will play out in courts about the definition and examples of what exactly is an extraordinary circumstance. Um, and then um, for the violent felonies, um, some of them can also go down to family court. Um, so if there's no display of a physical weapon, it's not a sex offense, and um, there's no significant physical injury, um, another term that will need to be defined by case law. If you don't have any of those three things and the district attorney doesn't file a motion within 30 days showing extraordinary circumstances, those cases will also go down to family court. Um, the benefit to having your case go down to family court is the opportunity for services and also no criminal record. Um, the uh, law does talk about services as optional for the kids who stay in the adult court. Um, so it does open up um, some services for them, but they will still have criminal records. Um, as we've talked about, kids will not be placed in adult within facilities with adults. Um, the kids that go through the family court process will be in facilities like their younger peers, um, detention facilities that currently exist but need more capacity. 
um, the kids whose cases stay in the adult court um, will have to go to a new facility that we don't have yet called a specialized secure detention facility for older adolescents. Um, we, as part of the planning, will need regulations about what that means and what constitutes such a facility and what the requirements will be to be such a facility. Um, detention is where you are pre-trial and if your sentence is less than a year. The kids who get sentenced out of the adult court system who are 16 and 17 year olds in the youth park, um, their placement will um, be in a facility operated by the Department of Corrections as opposed to the child serving um, organizations like ACS and OCFS with the involvement of the child serving field. So um, they, those who are worried about them, they'll have a more secure facility, but they will not be with adults. Um, so as I said, there are compromises throughout. Um, I think those are the most important parts, except for, I wanted to mention that there is going to be um, a raised age implementation task force. Um, and um, we're still awaiting um, information from the governor's office about like who's going to be on it and what exactly they're going to do. Um, but a lot of the work we're going to do um, in the coming months and years is trying to impact what the what the rollout of the law looks like. Um, you know, the law. A lot of what's in the law requires funding, requires services. We need a good continuum of services. Um, and so we're definitely not done yet. Um, the law gives us something to work with. So in terms of how you might all be helpful going forward, um, things like um, if there is proof behind some of the services that we advocate for, um, that would be something that would be helpful to the task force about, well, this is something we should pay for because it works. Um, I had two other ideas about future work that actually aren't related to juvenile justice. So I'll let you go first and then I'll come back. So the only other thing I would say, to just to add on to that, Stephanie, is that um, in terms of, of future work on Rizzi Age and the um, neuroscience behind it is that, you know, the, the age obviously wasn't raised for everyone. And we have future steps in, in mind for some of the work we'll do going forward, but there are still young people, 16 and 17 year olds, that have the same um, brain science that, that um, you know, scan brought to our attention who were charged with more serious offenses and are still facing, you know, adult sentences and, and things like that. So I do think that there's more opportunity for the even the same body of work um, to be to be used for our, our, our future um, goals. Yeah, that's a good point. There's also there are also 13 to 15 year olds right. currently going through the adult court system if they have a more serious crime. So it would apply for them too. Um, that's something we've all <coughs> wanted to change. Um, right. And um, we also, as part of our advocacy, have been advocating for something called youthful offender status, um, which is a status currently available to 16 to 19 year olds, where they're, they go through the adult system, but their um, sentences are shorter and their records can be sealed. And we were trying to increase that age to 21, so to allow up to 21. Um, and we didn't get that as part of the statute. Um, so we're still advocating for that. Um, part of why we think we didn't get it is the statute focused on 16 and 17 year olds, um, but the brain science applies for the 19 and 20 year olds. Right. And just to build on that, there's been a lot of work happening at the city level acknowledging the difference of 18 to 21 year olds as an age group, which I saw in one of the years that you had up there, um, looking at the different brain development um, for 18 to 21 year olds. So I, I think that continuing to look at how we're treating 18 to 21 year olds. For example, the city has eliminated the use of solitary confinement for 18 to 21 year olds at the city. So things like that, looking at that age group, um, and then looking at other city reforms happening in regard to 16 and 17 year olds. Um, as we look at these new facilities that are developed, right, ensuring that they're, even though they are more secure, even though they're for the kids with the serious offenses, that we're utilizing um, the types of policies and practices that are used by the Administration for Children's Services. Um, and not those used by the Department of Correction that can be more harmful to young people, like the use of, um, you know, pepper spray or, or things that are much more restrictive that you wouldn't see in a in a juvenile facility. Even though right now that's where our 13 to 15 year olds charged with serious violent offenses and going through the adult system, they're kept in administration for children's services. So those young people are not in adult correctional settings. So we, we do have a model for doing that. Um, so I think just looking at those those types of, of ways. 
um, would be really helpful. And I just wanted to throw out two other non-justice related issues, but things that I was thinking about in preparation for today that you might be interested in. Um, first of all, anything coming out of the Trump administration, where I know he's not a big scientist, but um, <laughs> science might help. We're our nonpartisan, but the field is still nonpartisan. Talk about that. Um, but uh, one of the things he's proposed to do is to eliminate all federal funding for our after-school programs for kids, claiming that there's no scientific proof that it works. Um, I don't know what it would mean to work, but. Um, We've always argued that it helps enable parents to work and it keeps kids safe and stimulated, developmentally appropriate. So there's something out there where he claims there's no proof. Um, and then on the similar, but um, we often use in our work where we know nothing about science, um, brain science research to on the early childhood side too. Um, that I mean, we're not totally making it up that, you know, that the early years is when the brain is forming and we do a lot of our advocacy around things like home, home visiting programs like nurse family partnership and um, child care and high quality preschool and all that, but also bringing in the brain science research. Great. Thank you so much. Copies of the report that we did in Crazy Age that Jen talked about on the back that you can grab on your way out. Uh, and next up, we have Katie Frank from the Center for Court Innovation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so, I work on a team that actually I think is pretty apt for this group. Um, it's called the Research Practice Strategies Team at the Center for Court Innovation, and our purpose is really to help bridge the um, often yawning gap between research and practitioners. So uh, mainly what I do is work with jurisdictions across the country that have some kind of grant, either from the federal government or from a foundation, um, to implement some aspect of justice reform. So we go in and um, both using research, although not so much neuroscience, but I am already thinking of some great ways that we could use more uh, neuroscience scientific research. Um, we go in and you know rely on the both the research that's in the criminal justice field and also um, just more practical kind of implementation strategies to work with these jurisdictions um, and help them really implement whatever aspect of reform that they are engaged in. So um, I think when we chat on the panel in a little bit, uh, the the main thing that I'm going to focus on is actually an initiative through the MacArthur Foundation. So I wanted to just set that up for you, give you a little bit of a sense of what that is. So um, the MacArthur Foundation actually has a history of working in juvenile justice reform relevant to this discussion. Um, they had an initiative called Models for Change that really relied on um, you know, looking at kind of the, the brain science and the developmentally appropriate responses to kids that are in the justice system. Um, now they've shifted towards an initiative um, focused on jail. And you know, it's it may seem very elementary to uh, some of you, but also want to be specific for those that don't know, jails as opposed to prisons. So they're very focused on jails for a couple of reasons. One, you know, they're meant to be short-term places that people stay. Prisons are where you go when you're sentenced. Jails can house people who are sentenced, but primarily they're housing people who are there pre-trial. Um, usually like somewhere in the range of 70% of people in local jails don't yet have a disposition on their case. So, you know, really people are meant to be kind of going in and then fairly quickly going out. As you might be able to guess, that's not necessarily the reality for many people in many communities. The other piece about jails is that they're actually, you know, controlled in a hyper-local way. So, you know, that can be a good or a bad thing, but in this current climate, it's, it's kind of interesting because often the reforms are really coming down to not even the state level, but really the county level. So, um, you know, jails in counties across the country can implement reforms, can really look towards how to reduce their population um, without necessarily waiting for larger either statewide reforms or larger national reforms. It's not to say that they're not impacted by those, but it is. It does feel like an opportunity in some ways to really look at reform in a different way, in a hyper-local way. So the MacArthur Foundation's 
the, the name of this initiative that, they're, um, that they've rolled out is the Safety and Justice Challenge. Um, and essentially it is focused on not only reducing the actual population of people in jails in local communities across the US, um, but also looking at how can they um, really engage communities locally and not just have this be kind of a separate, you know, something that's happening over here in the system, but how can they actually engage the local communities? And also, how can they really look at and address racial and ethnic disparities in the justice system? So they're not, you know, looking at this as just kind of a numbers piece and saying, you know, there are too many people um, generally in jails. While that's true, they're also saying, and there's a huge disproportionality in terms of who we're seeing in jail. So people of color are overrepresented in, I think it's so far every jurisdiction <laughs> that's part of the Safety and Justice Challenge. Um, and it's true you know, across the country, um, almost without exception. So these communities that are engaged in um, this reform effort really have a few different things that they're juggling. Um, they're looking at these aggressive targets for jail reduction, um, which are set by the foundation. And just to give you a sense, um, you know, they range anywhere from 15% to I think almost 30% reduction in the jail's average daily population. So not even just the admissions into jail, reducing the average uh, daily population by that much is a huge undertaking for these communities. Um, and in addition to that, then they're also, you know, having conversations with local stakeholders, trying to really get into the nitty gritty of, you know, not only how do we reduce these disparities, but also how can we do it in a way that partners with the community. Um, so, you know, in terms of the, um, I think I'll mention a couple of these things uh, when we chat on the panel, but there are, I think, some ways that the Safety and Justice Challenge can be really relevant to um, neuroscience and can be really relevant to um, or ripe for more research. Um, but one thing that comes to mind almost immediately is that um, more incarceration does not necessarily mean more community safety. And while there is some research to back that up, there are studies that um, say that you know even 24 hours of incarceration can have negative effects on many aspects of someone's life, 48 hours, even more negative effects. I think that that could be an area that we could bolster even more because especially for young people, or even if you're looking at the population of you know 18 to 21 or people that are kind of transitioning into adulthood, they're likely to get arrested much more and they're likely to get incarcerated much more. It may be in these local jails. Um, they may be seeing jails far more than they see prisons. I hope that they don't see prisons. Um, but, you know, jails really can be a place um, that people can kind of uh, meet with a lot of terrible consequences. So we, I think, not only want to continue to help these communities with reform and with, um, you know, being able to respond as the jail or as the treatment provider in the community, but also want to be able to provide more research that really underscores that, you know, this isn't actually even achieving the outcome that we say that we're looking for. Because I think when people, you know, kind of go with the, the line that we want to incarcerate people when they've done something wrong, the thought is, you know, accountability and then also community safety. But if we can show that there's not necessarily that clear of a linkage, that it's actually, you know, leading younger people and adults, you know, down a path that's just kind of um, snowballing into more negative effects, then I think we can really have a more nuanced conversation. So I'll leave it at that for now and then look forward to chatting more. Thanks. Thank you. And next we have Jean Casella from Solitary Watch. <laughs> but um, it doesn't move. I'll say it doesn't move. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't either, so. Um, 
So thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I, my name is Jean Casella, and I run an organization called Solitary Watch, which um, was founded uh, about seven years ago to bring what was then the, what, which at that time we called the, the biggest domestic human rights crisis that no one had ever heard of. Um, today in our prisons, just our state and federal prisons alone, not counting jails, immigrant detention, or juvenile facilities, there are between 70 and 80,000 people in solitary confinement on any given day. If you included all those other facilities, the number would certainly be over 100,000. Um, what solitary confinement means is spending 23 or more hours a day inside a cell um, that measures on average about seven by nine feet, is usually fairly bare with a bunk, uh, a cord concrete uh, desk perhaps, and um, a combination sink toilet, maybe a few books, maybe a few pictures if you're allowed to have them. Um, so spending 23 hours a day alone in that environment and uh, without work, um, usually with minimal um, mental health or medical treatment, um, no programming, and being released for one hour a day to exercise alone in a uh, walled or um, fenced uh, area that's usually referred to as a dog run, also, also alone. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, why I think you all being involved in the issue of solitary confinement is so important, um, and you know why I think it can be powerful. And we've just begun to work with SCAN, and you know I hope that that relationship is going to continue and grow in the future. One reason for this is the so-called corrections industry, which is clearly you know, not not very accurately named, is probably the least evidence-based practice in America, and that's saying a lot, because there's a lot going on here that you know is not evidence-based, <laughs> especially right now. Um, you know, the idea that we have recidivism rates for people who've been through the prison system of 70% or more, you know, can you imagine if, um, you know, a hospital uh, released 70% of their patients more sick than when they had entered? Um, and that they were all back within, you know, three years. Like, how long would that hospital stay in business? How how long would a business stay in business if 70% of the people were like returning the items? Or, I, you know, I don't know what parallels you can draw, but clearly something is is really, really not working um, in our prison system in general. And one answer to this question clearly is to send many, many fewer people to prison. Um, you know compared with um, even the, the most, uh, the harshest um, criminal justice systems in European countries, you know, we, um, we incarcerate you know, four or five times as many people. Um, people for uh, less, we incarcerate people for lesser crimes and we keep them much, much longer. Um, even violent, you know, people who've committed violent crimes in Europe are very unlikely to have life sentences, whereas there are 50,000 people in this country who are serving life sentences. Um, so the fact that this has just been allowed to proceed without any kind of oversight, um, any kind of sort of standards for performance, um, I think is, is really significant to the kind of work that you people are doing because uh, there's so much room for scientific evidence to be presented in this cause. Um, and, and not just, I mean, not just neuroscience, but all, all social sciences. And I think there is finally beginning to be a trend in that direction. Um, this may seem like a very, very discouraging time to be involved in any kind of criminal justice reform. And on the federal level, that's very, very true. Um, you know, for people in this business, like, we worry about Trump, but we worry about Jeff Sessions even more. I mean, he's really, like, and I, I don't even care about the nonpartisan. <laughs> um, so, um, 
But on the state and, and local levels, there is still an opportunity. I mean, people are beginning to realize that even if you have no sympathy for people who are accused of or convicted of committing crimes, this is a public safety issue, this is a financial issue, and clearly this is also a human rights issue if, if you care to look at it that way, which I, it's hard to avoid doing that, especially in the, in the case of solitary confinement. Um, about 5% of the people in uh, prison overall in this country are in solitary confinement. 50% of the prison suicides occur in solitary. Um, you know, not to be too graphic, but the challenges of killing yourself in a bare cell um, have led people to bite through the veins in their arms or jump headfirst off their bunks. I mean, such is the anguish that's caused by um, living in that kind of extreme isolation and sensory deprivation. So I'm going to talk very briefly about um, what's going on in New York right now in relation to this issue, because it's an exciting time to be in this state, because potentially New York could be leading the way in solitary confinement reform. Um, <coughs> there's a very active um, consortium of organizations who have gotten together in something called the Campaign for Alternatives to Isolated Confinement. Um, three years ago, they introduced a bill um, in both uh, houses of the New York State Legislature called the HALT Solitary Confinement Bill, which stands for Humane Alternatives to Long-Term Solitary Confinement. And um, if passed, it would be the most progressive um, solitary confinement reform legislation in the country. It would, vis it would um, limit, in generally limit, the use of solitary confinement to two weeks. Right now in New York, we have people who have been in solitary for 20 to 30 years. Um, it would, um, it acknowledges that some people need um, additional attention and have like seriously problematic or dangerous behavior. And it would address that by creating um, residential rehabilitation units where after two weeks, people who um, still were considered not ready to return to a general population would need to be sent and would have um, at least six hours a day of rehabilitative programming out of their cells. Solitary for um, anyone under 18, for um, anyone over 60, I believe, um, for anyone with a diagnosed serious mental illness would be completely banned. Um, I think they would be allowed to be there for like 48 hours while they were figuring out placement for them, but beyond that, no solitary at all. And the effect of solitary on people who have underlying mental illness, I mean, you can imagine what, what, what that's like for them. So I'm actually gonna, um, while we're having our question and answers, pass around a petition encouraging people to, uh, encouraging legislators and the governor to support the HALT Act. The status right now of the HALT Act is that um, there are enough votes to pass it in the assembly. Um, right now, uh, the, um, the campaign is focusing on uh, Carl Heasty, who's the speaker of the assembly, and who has to schedule the bill, put the bill on the floor for discussion and a vote. So if that doesn't happen this year, it will certainly happen next year. There are the votes in the assembly to pass the bill. The Senate, which is still Republican controlled, will be more of a challenge, but there's considerable um, support also in the Senate. So I'm sure the bill is going to be revised and watered down before it gets passed, but it's, but it's an exciting time to be working on this issue. Um, just to say a few words before I close about you know, how how neuroscience can impact this. For one thing, the way that um, courts have reacted to things like solitary confinement to prison <coughs> conditions um, are mostly to consider them in the light of the Eighth Amendment, which bans cruel and unusual punishment. But cruel and unusual <coughs> punishment has been defined pretty narrowly by the courts in this country. I mean, witness the fact that we still have capital punishment. But also, when solitary confinement cases have gone to the courts, they've, you know, they've said, well, you can't really show physical harm. Um, 
or you, you know, you don't have scientific data to support your claims that this is like that harmful. And I really think that as um, the research advances on the effects of isolation, which is complicated because you can't do experimentation on um, people in prison, but even animal experiments um, showing the, the profound effect on the brain of even relatively short periods of isolation, I think that those are gonna become um, really important tools not only to convince legislators to pass legislation, but also to um, influence the courts in making decisions that would place limits on things like solitary confinement. So thank you, I look forward to your question. Um, okay, so we're just gonna set up uh, some chairs and we're gonna have our panel discussion. Um, okay, well, um, first of all, thank you so much for um, talking to us about all the different um, you know, work that you do. I think we, we have a, a very interesting coverage of like going from campaigning and raising awareness and lobbying and doing all that work to talking about implementation and <coughs> actually communicating with the court and uh, looking at the best practices. So that's a very nice kind of overall coverage. Um, and of course, you all work with very difficult uh, aspects and things that are sometimes dauntingly um, hard to think about how to change, how to um, implement uh, um, uh, criminal justice reform, but you all are, uh, the fact that you're here kind of attests to the fact that it's possible to uh, make an impact. So what I want to ask you is, um, in your campaign work, in your specific work with the courts, um, what w would you say have been the most successful uh, strategies? and what uh, you uh, think that might uh, actually, that you might share across the different things that, um, that the panel uh, has been talking about. Maybe we can start with, uh, with that and that. Sure. So I think, you want me to Yeah, you're right. <laughs> right. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I think for us, I mean, the, for the Raise the AGR campaign, um, persistence <laughs> was, was the most important thing. It was really tough to keep people engaged because you get so close and folks get so excited and then it just doesn't happen and there's no real answer why it just isn't a priority and you have to be able to convince people to come back and try again year after year after year. Um, but that, you know, people wanted to come back, right? It was still a, a, a burning concern and burning issue. Um, I think what was really critical was having a diversity of voices. I think being able to have people from all over the state, um, to have people who would be traditional advocates, but to be able to pull out folks who were not necessarily traditional advocates. I think what you commented on the public safety piece was really critical for us. Be able to highlight that treating young people in the adult justice system increases the chances they're gonna return to the justice system. It does not meet their needs. And so I think being able to show those non-traditional voices was also really, really critical for us. Yeah, I just had a couple things. I think the voices of the young people made a huge difference. Um, but I always say in advocacy, part of it's just a little bit of luck. Um, and um, while I don't think Trump is that lucky, um, it um, gave this opportunity. You know, Governor Cuomo wants to be seen as progressive. Um, and we had, you know, four years ago sort of called him out as New York and North Carolina who really wants to be in the same bucket. North Carolina is not progressive. Um, New York and North Carolina are the only states to do this, and he took it on, um, and he lost with us three, you know, twice. And so we weren't sure how many more times he would tee it up because he doesn't like to lose. Um, but he did it again, um, and he went all in this time. Um, and I think that's partially a little bit of luck based on um, wanting to look progressive. Towards the end of the session, um, there was a day where um, we left Albany thinking the bill had died, um, and the Senate had gone home, and um, there was a piece um, by Van Jones that said that raised the age was Cuomo's first test of 2020, um, and then the next thing you knew, the Senate got called back, um, and <laughs> raised the age was back. Yeah, um, and so I think there's part of that, and that's why the persistence is so important, because you can't plan the luck. 
um, and so you just have to keep doing it and keep doing it. Um, and you know, we wore down the legislators. They heard our arguments over and over again. It's like, oh, here come the raised age people. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the education behind it, you know, helped us. Uh, I would say, not to sound like a broken record, but <laughs> partnerships with researchers, and I think you know that can span many disciplines. But in particular, um, my work with jail reduction and the MacArthur Foundation, I've seen. Uh, some sites be really successful or make uh, faster progress because of their partnerships with local universities. So just to give you one example, um, one of the jurisdictions I work with is St. Louis County, which of course is the home of Ferguson. Um, and they uh, you know, have myriad issues that they're dealing with when they're looking at um, you know, really addressing their jail population. But one of the things that they really have um, going for them is a partnership with their local criminology department. So um, they have some progressive practices that were, I think, kind of waiting in the wings, ready to sort of bloom under this initiative. But it's really been the partnership with that criminology department that's helped to educate some of the local uh, criminal justice stakeholders, including judges about you know, why these evidence-based practices work. So for example, they had, uh, or they have, a locally validated pretrial risk assessment tool that they were already using, but the, the judges and some of the criminal justice stakeholders hadn't been educated on the fact that that's essentially the gold standard in terms of a risk assessment tool. So all over the country right now, jurisdictions are turning towards risk assessment and they don't come without their controversies. I mean, they're right now another area that's kind of burgeoning is looking at how can we make sure that risk assessment tools don't actually replicate racial bias or, you know, making sure that the tool is really unpacking some of those issues. But that being said, you know, risk assessment tools so far are doing better than, um, you know, basically gut judgment or clinical judgment has done in the past in terms of deciding whether someone will be a risk. So St. Louis had this tool, they were implementing it kind of on a pilot <coughs> basis, but it was that partnership with the criminology department um, and really helping to educate the criminal justice stakeholders on you know, why that's the gold standard and why that's better than just kind of business as usual. Um. Well, solitary confinement at, is at a relatively early stage in the re, as a reform movement, um, but I'll just throw out some things about some of the things that I, I have witnessed being effective. I mean, first, um, someone mentioned an article that helped sway um, Cuomo. I mean, my background is actually in journalism and media, as, as was the co-founder of Solitary Watch, and we started out just trying to tell a story that hadn't been told. And particularly feeling that that was important because people in prison are, I believe, the most dehumanized individuals in our society. And to be able to just even to use like narratives and firsthand accounts and storytelling to, you know, just present these individuals as human beings who are suffering and, you know, by many definitions, including the United Nations, being tortured. Um, is a powerful message. It's going to reach only a certain segment of the population, but you know, a significant segment. So I think um, media has to be an important part of any campaign. Um, in some states and jurisdictions, uh, litigation has been an effective tool for um, for beginning some incremental reforms of solitary confinement. Um, but that works best again when it's supported by media and when it's supported by a, grass, a real grassroots campaign. In California, for example, the grassroots campaign originated inside um, the solitary confinement unit at Pelican Bay State Prison, where um, a group of men went on hunger strike that soon spread throughout the California prison system until there were 30,000 people on hunger strike um, protesting solitary confinement conditions. And that really helped spur um, the people of California and the, the government and the correction system to take notice and it also supported some litigation that was going on at that time. Um, legislation is another way to go. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, that's a real uphill climb. I mean, passing any kind of legislation to make things easier on criminals, which is the way a lot of people will look at it, even when those supposed criminals are, you know, 
14 years old, even if they have serious mental illness, no, no matter, you know, even if they come from extreme poverty, even if racism is obviously a huge factor, it's still very hard to, um, you know, law and order gets votes and being soft on crime still to this day, you know, is something that politicians are scared of. But if you're, if you're up for like a long, hard climb, it can be done. Um, so I want to I wanna, like revisit a little bit what um, you just said, Katie, talking about the risk assessment tool and mm -hmm. kind of giving an example of like a research or evidence-based approach um, that you had a very concrete example. What, what role do you guys think uh, scientific arguments play in, in your work? You've talked a little bit, you've touched a little bit on this uh, in your talk, but I want you to expand on that. And sort of in the same vein, what what kinds of arguments do you think are better received? And is there a difference in terms of the reception, uh, whether you're talking to uh, legislators or to uh, court-related uh, you know, staff or to the general public through advocacy and journalism? So um, tell us a little bit about the role of science and how to you know, approach people to, to, to scientific um, uh, notions. Oh, I think on all of the levels and all of the audiences you just uh, mentioned that scientific arguments are really powerful. I mean, for the general public, it's, it's impressive, it's incontrovertible, you know, in a way that um, even these, I think it's great to combine them with, you know, more uh, human stories, but the two in combination, I think, are a really formidable um, argument. Um, I think for things, I, m I mentioned that in the courts, there are actually the ways that laws have been written and interpreted, um, actually, not only the Eighth Amendment, but um, there was a law passed in the 90s um, called the Prison Litigation Reform Act, which really raised the bar um, for people in prison bringing lawsuits, challenging their conditions. And it did require them pretty much to be able to show that physical harm was being done to them. And so people have not, up to this point, been able to bring um, suits on the basis of even 30 years in solitary confinement. Um, that, the, you know, this, this kind of um, scientific evidence could really be a breakthrough in terms of um, how the courts are forced to address this issue. So I think that's really important. Um, I think in some cases it can be tough uh, with court stakeholders in particular, it depends on the issue, because <laughs> if they feel uh, defensive, I think, you know, those have been some of the hardest conversations that I've been a part of, and in particular, I struggle with this kind of uh, draw towards implicit bias training, because I think that while it's important, it also, um, kind of is a, I think there are deeper issues that I wish sometimes court stakeholders could get to and implicit bias kind of like stays up here and, and um, anyway, it, so implicit bias is one example, but I think that um, in some cases, having scientific evidence can actually be a boon to court stakeholders because it explains something that they've been experiencing in the court setting. So one example there is um, some of my, my past work has been on gender responsivity and women who come through the criminal justice system and there are different pathways. Why you know women come to the criminal justice system versus men or why transgender individuals come through the criminal justice system um, versus men. And of course, many of the studies about um, the criminal justice system have focused on men. So there's, there's less research, but there is a burgeoning field that shows really, you know, oftentimes trauma is the underlying reason that women are ending up in the justice system. So I've found that talking with judges in particular about what some of the responses are that they're seeing in the courtroom from their women litigants, um, from women who are coming through as defendants, can be really kind of eye-opening for them. So I've uh, worked with judges who, you know, before understanding some of that research or before understanding some of that evidence said, you know, they would be so frustrated when they had dockets, um, particularly if it was around, um, you know,
know, crimes that often involved arrests of a lot of women, like prostitution or loitering, they, these judges would be so frustrated because women would have a flat affect or they would, you know, talk back to the judge or have an attitude, you know, like all these things that judges found kind of difficult to just get through the docket. And then when you explain that actually all those things line up with trauma reactions and people aren't actively trying to, you know, make your life hard or make the docket last longer or make it your job as a judge difficult, they actually, you know, kind of had an aha moment like, oh, this actually explains the difficulty that I'm having and gives me a way through or gives me an understanding that can help me find a way through this or a better way to do this. So I think in that case, you know, scientific evidence can be very helpful. I think there's going to be a lot of work to do in the area of evidence-based. Um, we throw around evidence-based all of the time, um, and a lot of programs and services in all sorts of fields um, cling to the evidence-based, and sometimes government is only looking for evidence-based. Um, but the sort of issue is that, like, what do we mean when we say evidence-based? Most of these programs were not done in controlled, there are a few, like North Carolina Partnership, but most of them are not controlled experiments. Um, and we've started to use programs that were tested, say, in juvenile justice, and we use them now in child welfare, and we say they're evidence-based, but they're actually not evidence-based in child abuse prevention. They're evidence-based in not recidivism for juveniles. Um, and so there's kind of become like a mumbo, jumbo, of you know, I don't want to call it fake science, but like people clinging to these evidence-based programs because people want to use programs they know are going to work. Um, and so I think there's like an opening there to find what, what really is evidence-based and what might work and needs to be tried and just to be clear about it so that when we look for the programs we need for certain people, we're actually matching the person or the family to the service that actually is going to work. Yeah, just off that stuff, I think another thing with evidence-based is that there, um, it really um, stifles uh, some um, creative development of, of programs that work but maybe don't have the funding to go through the types, uh, jump to the types of hoops necessary to get a certain accreditation or be considered evidence-based, things like, you know, working with credible messengers or some of the work happening that we see that we know is impactful but isn't ever going to meet that sort of standard. Um, but I was just gonna uh, go back to actually where, where Jen started, that um, I think what matters is how you're framing anything you're presenting. So Jen mentioned the idea that, you know, this um, fact about brain development um, <coughs> going into 25 might be misconstrued as someone's not culpable. You know, someone's not responsible. We're trying to say that like, no one should be held accountable if they commit a crime, if their you know, brain isn't developed. So I think it's just um, being able to um, know your audience and be able to appropriately um, use anything um, and, and anticipate any um, unexpected uh, blowback that might come from, from something like that so that people aren't hearing um, kids can't ever be held responsible, <laughs> you know. Yeah, so touching on that a little bit, uh, uh, I remember back when we were first thinking about how to work on the, on the report. Uh, that was definitely something that was important for us was to get a little bit of guidance of like these are the types of arguments that we we want to buttress and these are the types of arguments that we want to like move away because they're not uh, you know, they're not going to be w well received or because well, we've already tested this and it doesn't work. Um, so in terms of what uh, we can do for you uh, to support your causes to uh, facilitate um, uh, access to the neuroscience that's already there or perhaps promote more neuroscience where it is needed um, and, and psychology. Uh, what would you say um, is, what, what, where would you um, tell scientists who are interested uh, to, to work on this uh, to start? What can we do to help you advance your causes? Um, you can start anywhere. Um. I'm going to mention several things. Um, SCAN did prepare a, um, a fact sheet on, on science and solitary confinement for um, the lobby day that was held last month um, by the Campaign for Alternatives to Isolated Confinement. And um, one thing that um, the feedback I got from people who were going in groups to meet with legislators 
was there was one um, point that was made on that fact sheet that um, when experiments were conducted, for example, on mice, um, uh, uh, experiments regarding the effects of isolation, that scientists had to get special permission, mm. you know, to um, even hold mice in, um, you know, more austere, isolated environments right. for relatively brief periods of time. But you know, there's no permission that's needed to put someone in salt. Yeah. And the person who's been in solitary the longest in this country was released last year after 43 years in solitary in Louisiana. Um, and there was no law or even, you know, standard that was being violated by that practice. And that really struck people. Yeah. Um, that we, you know, that boils down to, in a simplified way, you know, we have higher standards for how we treat mice than for how we treat human yeah. beings. And I mean, I think anyone here who works with uh, animals can attest to the fact that you know, if there is any detection or suspicion of like wrongdoing, you know, that, that investigator risks, uh, you know, right. a huge, huge problems and, and consequences. So it, it's not just saying that, it's actually enforced. Um, so I think that that's an interesting point. So things that really shock the conscience, even of, you know, people who might be resistant to it. I think, you know, something we haven't mentioned is the Khalid Browder story, which I think for both of our, you know, issues, all of our issues, what was a really, you know, profound um, example sure. to be able to hold up. Sure and know, probably uh, Khalid Browder was accused of stealing a backpack. Um, he couldn't make 3000 his family couldn't make $3,000 bail, and so, he was held on Rikers for like two and a half years, including um, two years, and, and including many months in solitary confinement for some, you know, minor rule violation. Um, when he was released, sorry, he got released because the charges were dismissed um, after being at Rikers for three years, and then he committed suicide. And then he, he committed suicide. He was unable to recover from the experience, and. There was a, a big article about him in the New Yorker that just got passed around and passed around. And I know when um, President Obama wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post um, uh, calling for limits on the use of solitary confinement in the federal system, especially for children, he, he cited the Khalif Browder story. And he just had a street named after him in New York this last week, I think it was. And, and certainly uh, Mayor de Blasio has mentioned him in terms of getting um, young people out of solitary on Rikers. So, um, you know, so things like that can have incredible power. One thing that hasn't been mentioned that I just want to throw out there is I think something that could be really powerful is more research on the effects of um, being a prison guard um, because honestly, the biggest single barrier to um, prison reform is the uh, corrections officers unions. Um, not the people who are, not the wardens, not the administrators, you know, some of them are like reasonable people who actually want to make like incremental change, not even the politicians, but um, the rank and file guards. And, and I just think that as much as, you know, prison is a dehumanizing experience for incarcerated people, it's also an incredibly dehumanizing and hardening experience for the people who work there. And I think it could be very powerful to be able to make arguments about how this is affecting the psychology and brain chemistry of, of people who are working in these places. Um, I think one area that really could use more evidence, more research, more neuroscientific research is this area which um, I don't, know, I don't like a lot of the language that's used in different areas of criminal justice reform, but individuals are being called frequent utilizers, which like makes it sound like you have like a pass or like you're a frequent flyer, <laughs> like none of that is humanizing. Um, but the, the, the focus on frequent utilizers is that there are individuals who um, are cycling through jails again and again and again. And you know, there are many underlying reasons for this, but uh, within the uh, MacArthur's Safety and Justice Challenge, a lot of what we're seeing is either related to um, substance use and addiction issues, um, or related to trauma 
you know, which I touched on a bit. So I think there's plenty of research that exists on, you know, addiction and on trauma, and some of it related to, um, you know, how that ties into the prison system. But we still, I think, have a ways to go on specifically how it ties into the jail system. There, there is research there, but I think there could be so much more in terms of, especially people, you know, who are cycling through or frequently cycling through. Often it is through jails, you know, and so these are the places where, in an ideal world, um, they could be connected with treatment or connected with resources. I was briefly talking with Sylvia before the panel about, um, again, St. Louis County, they have an interesting program where they actually are able to administer Vivitrol at the jail for people. And I, I feel like, you know, if there was more um, tying that type of evidence to jails or saying, you know, what, what does this look like in the jail setting, that that would be really helpful to the field. And then with trauma in particular, I think, um, specifically looking at women and why women cycle through again and again. Again, I just think there could be even more research and, and help from neuroscience in that aspect. You're all what we call in my field um, non-traditional partners um, because um, the legislature, if, when I meet with the legislators, the mayor, whoever, they expect me to want to raise the age and help kids. Um, and so I don't come off neutral at all. Um, I come off as somebody who um, would take this, a position regardless of whether it was the right position to take or not. Um, but you carry with you this sort of neutrality um, of being a scientist, and you're going to lay out the facts as they are. Um, and that gives you an enormous amount of power that we actually don't really have. Um, and so um, in addition to showing what doesn't work and why a lot of the practices we've talked about are, are bad, I think also being able to show what works, um, which is why um, we wanted part of that report to talk about the adolescent brain being re receptive to rehabilitation, to really just be able to lay out the facts of what works. Um, I think a lot of my suggestions really relate to some of the conditions of confinement, you would say, that we've, we've discussed, um, particularly in regard to young people and the impact that some of the traumas that they experience in jail settings or prison settings have on their development. Um, uh, in regard to solitary and the use of solitary, I think uh, um, looking at some of the, the city's made tremendous progress in terms of eliminating the use of solitary for 18 to 21 year olds, but kind of looking at what is that threshold because there is a continuum of, of um, types of settings that are more restrictive than general population, so does it make a significant difference if you have a few hours out versus the one hour out, things like that. I think looking at some of those solutions and seeing if they're really, um, you know, um, as beneficial as we assume them to be. Um, I really think looking at uh, young people charged with violent offenses is something that no one wants to touch because politically it's very hard to look at, but I think um, looking at uh, some of the differences um, and who are these young people, in some ways they're young people that just messed up in a, a much more um, significant way, um, but are facing life sentences, you know, are, are, are facing um, incarceration for the rest of their lives. So looking at um, really addressing how do we how do we work with these young people? How do you hold someone accountable in an age-appropriate way when we're talking about a really serious violent offense? Um, and I think looking uh, at just at trauma, like I said, in regard to young people who are developing. So some of the conditions young people face, like I mentioned isolation, but like chemical agents, use of pepper spray, things like that. Excessive use of force, Jen showed the slide from the Nunez Monitor, right, which came out of the Department of Justice report that showed that 16 to 18 year olds at Rikers were having real, you know, excessive skull fractures and really extreme conditions. So like how does that um, impact a young person um, for the rest of their life, right? That type of trauma that if it happened on the street, if your skull was fractured, would be um, justifiable that it would affect you for the rest of your life, right? That you would be impacted the rest of your life from this violent attack. But it's sort of unspoken if it happens um, when you're when you're in custody. Um, and then I think also someone touched on um, earlier the issue of how even 24 hours or 48 hours can have this negative effect. So I think playing that more out and looking particularly at the juvenile justice system where we have kids who can be arrested in New York at age seven. Um, and so looking at juvenile detention, we have a really large chunk of kids who are in juvenile detention zero to three days. And that's great that they're getting out, but 
what is that impact of even spending one, two, three days when you're 10 years old, 11 years old, um, in that type of restrictive setting? Um, so could I add just one thing? Sure. Um, just, um, I think I'm thinking about the power of expert witnesses um, in a lot of different settings. So with the issue of solitary, for example, there are like three guys who everybody who knows and works in the solitary field knows are psychologists and psychiatrists who testify on the um, psychological effects of solitary confinement, whether it's at a, a legislative hearing or a court case. Um, and I know that I went to, you know, with regard to neuroscience, I went to a conference last year um, on solitary confinement at the University of Pittsburgh, and it was the first conference I had seen where there was a panel of neuroscientists mm -hmm. talking about the, um, you know, the effects on the brain of, um, of isolation. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a lot of, there were a lot of lawyers there, and there were a lot of advocates there, and I think there was a lot of excitement about the idea, like, mm -hmm. in a few years, a little bit more, and a little bit honing and deciding how we can use this, you know, these people are going to be expert witnesses too, and it's going to add this whole like new piece of, of ammunition in our toolbox. Mm -hmm. So that that's that's pretty exciting. All right, so. great. Um, thank you. So maybe now we can open it to um, to the audience. Um, so I don't know if anyone has a question. Yeah. So um, maybe you alluded to it a little bit, but something that I've noticed listening to people like Jeff Sessions talk about, you know, getting tough on crime, is that the language that they use is also a language that's based in data, like they cite sources, and, you know, you do a little bit of digging, and you realize that the experimental design is a little bit off, or they, you know, misinterpreted or appropriated some figure that they like. Um, and so I'm wondering whether you have gotten any, like, blowback or anything like that with people looking at this report that was put out and people saying, well, like, because, you know, they, they kind of bastardized data to meet their needs, whether they've accused you of doing the same. We have it with data, but there's a definite fear factor in anything related to criminal justice. And so we haven't really been attacked with data, except for, I'll give one example where we got attacked with data. Um, but already there is an article today um, a young person upstate who um, committed a crime when he was 16 and was released and he reoffended and they claimed he was the face of the Raise the Age campaign. He's been reelected for pulling a knife on his mother. Like, um, there are legislators who are angry. Um, when we meet with them, they talk about our bill as the gang recruitment bill. I mean, there's definite anger. We did not sell this to everybody. Um, and I think there's fear out there. We did once have an issue with the Republican majority um, claimed that kids who were 16 and 17 year old, years old who committed sex offenses were more likely to recidivate, um, which we were actually talking about misdemeanor sex offenses. So these are like kids who grab somebody on the subway or text photos to their friends. These aren't racist. Um, and so it's actually not true that 16 and 17 year olds um, are more likely to recidivate, especially in misdemeanor sex offense, but actually on any sex offense than an older person. Um, but we had a real back and forth argument about it um, where they did cite data um, and the judges who were there said, well, I've never seen a case come back in my whole sports life. Um, but then we found data on the other side that we shared um, they never apologized or said you were right, but they didn't move the misdemeanor sex offenses from family court to the adult court, which is what they were threatening. Mm -hmm. um, so there definitely is sometimes back and forth. I would say oftentimes it's not cited. Um, and so if you can actually find citable data, mm -hmm. that helps in response. Um, like even this thing about the gang recruitment, there's a lot of belief that by raising the age you increase um, because the older people in the gang will now know they can use a 16-year-old instead mm -hmm. of a 15-year-old, that that will increase gangs. Mm -hmm. um, there's no proof behind that, but there's also no way to prove it's not true. Mm -hmm. um, so there's definitely things like that that happen. Hi, uh, my name is Angela. I'm also with SCAN. Um, so I was really interesting to hear you guys talk about 
Uh, so she sort of solitary and raised the age sort of anecdotes of how our arguments, our scientific arguments have landed because a lot of times we're writing these reports for you guys are working on them and we don't actually see the impact on legislators and people outside the scientific community. So what I was wondering is if you can talk about any sort of negative responses you've had to sort of scientific data, if there have been any, or more specifically how people who are generally less responsive to criminal justice reform have responded to these data-based arguments. I mean, this is a very unscientific response, but to my mind, the people who have responded negatively to it are the people who don't want to hear it to begin with and don't want there to be evidence mm -hmm. to contradict. And, and you know, you before mentioned, you know, Jeff Sessions citing facts. You know, the idea of using Jeff Sessions and facts in the same <laughs> sentence is, you know, in itself really outrageous. And, and because he is of anyone, you know, and, and Trump too, like they're clearly appealing to the fears of, you know, particularly white people and, um, you know, it, it, they're, they're just playing on people's fears and emotions. Um, and so the negative reactions that I've gotten have been like, um, that I've heard, have been people who don't want to believe it because it runs counter to all of the underlying prejudices <clears throat> that, that they already have and it makes them harder to like maintain their unscientific and usually racist um, belief systems. So frankly, that's, that's the only response I have to that. I had the very same thought. When you asked that, I thought to myself, it's not that anyone counters the data, it's that they just don't care. <laughs> like that's They don't care or they don't like it. Right. Or, yeah. And so I think often, you know, you talk about brain development research and, um, you know, a typical response is something like, you do the crime, you do the time. You right, know? exactly. So it's just that I don't think that we've had folks, like, counter it, though, necessarily. I do think that that's where partnering with someone that can help on implementation is important because I think, you know, in in some of the jail reform work that I've done, um, you know, if evidence, scientific evidence shows that people need to change the way that, you know, they do business and that's an unwelcome realization, then I think the, the way to address that pushback is to have people that can partner with them either locally or like, you know, an organization that does the work nationally to say, okay, you know, here's what other communities have done when they've hit this roadblock because it's not necessarily a surprising thing. Like communities hit up against the same issues. They manifest in different ways, but they're underlying, I mean, ultimately the same issues. So I do think that, you know, again, then comes back to the kind of research partnered with implementation piece. I found some of the people who were most resistant to hearing about the data um, were people who were responding back to you with things that weren't about data but were about individual stories. Right. So like, you know, in 1986, somebody killed somebody yeah. in one of the senator's districts and it was really terrible and it was a kid and it was a horrible story. Mm -hmm. She could tell Isaac's story over and over again. She had three stories, she told them three, over and over again. So like, she couldn't be moved by brain science because she was very caught not in the research and the numbers and the data, but in these real stories. Um, we tried bringing other real stories to her, but some people just really, at the end of the day, can't be moved. And I and imagine you, and Jeff Sessions to actually, is in that bucket. Yeah, you have to accept that and move <laughs> yeah. on. And I mean, I, I, I don't know how true this is, but I've always heard that the whole reason we had um, automatic uh, adult prosecutions of 16-year-olds was because of one person, Willie Bosquet. That's, That's a 13, 13 to 15 year old. That's, That's a 13 why we to 15 year old. So the okay. history on the I mean, there's, this, there's always going to be one 15 yeah. year old who really did kill three people on the subway for no yep. reason. Yeah. There's yeah. always going to be one person who killed four guards and actually needs to be in some kind of, you know, separate housing from the rest of the general population. And there are, like, your, your opponents are always going to cite those case. few, pe that one case, mm -hmm. even if there's a hundred thousand people in solitary mm -hmm. and ten that might actually need to be there, and even they could be like, you know, at least have a TV set or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, mean, I think part of what we did was we tried to, you know, we we, we talked about accountability too. Um, 
we, we don't want kids killing people, and we don't want people to die, and we're not looking for people to get hurt. We certainly don't want kids killing other kids. Um, and so, you know, we talked about accountability too, but that it had to be developmentally appropriate, and it shouldn't carry lifelong consequences in the same way. Um, and that for most kids, that means some kind of treatment so that nothing like what happened ever happens again. So we, you know, we weren't saying, you know, let all the kids go without any accountability. Yeah, so I had a question mostly for Katie. Um, so you talked a little bit about pre-trial risk assessment. Mm -hmm. So I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but the backdrop of, or at least backstory behind risk assessments of this kind is that you have certain algorithms that input um, like data about this particular person who's about to get tried, and they'll evaluate how much, how likely this person is to reoffend based on all the information you're putting about the type of crime that he did, or he or she, where, where they came from, some of their demographic information. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been to some talks recently, um, particularly if you know Kathy O'Neill, who wrote this book called Weapons of Mass Destruction. Mm -hmm. She came to NYU recently and gave a talk about how algorithms are inherently biased. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to hear your perspective on it, which is that people are inherently biased, and if you are just going to let people, particularly judges and juries, come to their own conclusions about people, um, you're going to get worse outcomes. Is there actual evidence, this is the question part, <laughs> is there actual evidence to suggest that using algorithms, which may, for instance, codify like the zip codes of people, like their, their demographic information, like their socioeconomic status, mm -hmm. potentially uh, punishing lower income racial minorities more, is there evidence that these algorithms are doing a better job not being racist or biased in some way than judges and juries, or is it more or less a wash? So, I mean, this is an area that definitely like needs a next level exploration because so far there is evidence that risk assessment tools are doing a better job than just judges, you know, using the case file in front of them and their life experience or their legal training to, I mean, they would argue they're not using their life experience, but you know, they're um, using their perspective uh, to make a decision. Um, so there is evidence that the tools are doing a better job than the judges. There is also evidence, and I, you know, fully think that this is something we should be exploring, that the static factors that are used in the risk assessment can perpetuate bias. So, you know, the fact that there essentially are more people of color who are being arrested and arrests are part of the scoring of risk assessment. You know, like you can see kind of the, the natural end point of that. So um, the, the other piece though is that the um, risk assessment tools are being used pre-trial um, and typically static factor only. And this is so early on in the case that an important part of the risk assessment process is also the, um, you know, the risk need responsivity theory as a whole. So you're also looking at the needs of people, the treatment that they might require, or the treatment that might help them not recidivate. Um, that being said, then there's also all these nuances about not overburdening someone with treatment if really they're not at high risk of even committing another misdemeanor. So you don't want to, because people have gone like too far in that direction. They've said like, oh, you know, like. Sure, they have um, you know addiction issues. They have mental health issues. They have trauma. Like, let's give them a 52-week you know treatment program, and it'll be great. Like, no, if, if they committed one misdemeanor, like <laughs> they should probably have unsupervised release. Like, you know, there's there's not a need to go too much further the other direction. But um, yes, I mean it's. I guess the answer is it's complicated. It requires much more research. But so far, the best that we have are these validated risk assessment tools, and I think okay. we can continue. And about the juveniles, so we use a risk assessment tool for juvenile detention in New York. Um, and, and just a couple of things about it. One is that we have seen since the use of the tool, the numbers of kids being detained pre-trial dramatically decline, mm -hmm. um, which again doesn't mean there isn't bias in it, but the numbers have come down, and the majority of the kids that we're talking about are kids of color arrested and then not being detained. Um, it also gave us data to get a better sense of who was and who was not being detained. Um, and so you get some good data out of it. And so for example, um, you could see that kids who were in foster care <coughs> were more likely to be detained. 
and that's because one of the components on the risk assessment is whether or not the parent is there to take the kid home with them, um, and the kids in foster care didn't have that. And that allowed the city to create, um, implement for children in foster care the requirement that either the foster parent or the caseworker be there in court so that the kid wasn't standing there by themselves um, to bring down their score on the risk assessment. So, um, you know, there are ways that the data helps us and then helps us address other systemic issues. Um, but I agree that the more research and data that we have on these things, the better. I think there are a lot of worrisome aspects to risk assessment, but just to boil it down, I think the system is so screwed up that it's probably in most cases an improvement, <laughs> although we need to try to make it even better than it is. Ditto. <laughs> okay, maybe we can take uh, one or two more. Um, yeah, okay. go ahead. Um, I'm a creative arts therapist in a non-secure placement, and it's daunting to think of all the, I mean, it's wonderful, but also daunting to think of all the kids that will need to be replaced. And I know the task force, you know, is still being worked out, but what do you think the place of science is for going forward with? The new juvenile detention centers. I mean, I think we'll see a slight skewing in age just because the age of placement will be a little older. So I could see maybe programmatically there needing to be um, an assessment of age appropriateness at, at a much more um, narrow look, not just adolescents overall. I do think you'll have obviously kids who are in juvenile placement right now or young people were arrested before they were 16, right? So depending how long their court case takes, depending how long their placement is, they're about you know, 15, 16, 17. So if we're seeing kids arrested at 17, if they skew 18, 19, 20. You know? So I think maybe looking at some of those nuances, probably some differences in terms of education. If young people are older, if they you know, may have different educational needs, um, you know, about a quarter of the kids in placement right now are middle school kids, probably less likely with the 16 and 17 year olds. Though the majority of those middle school kids are over age, under credited middle school kids. Um, so I think maybe looking at that nuance of even though it's just two years, is there a difference in needs in terms of housing? Are they not going home to live with a family? Are they 20, 21 and maybe in need of some type of, of a different type of, of housing than a family um, situation? So I think, I think maybe something like that um, in terms of how, how science would look at that older age cohort going into the juvenile system. Hopefully there will be um, time for all of this. Um, cause even though there's a delay in the implementation, it's not that long, which we've supported because we want to get moving. Um, but building new facilities and siting them and getting people trained and built and everything um, takes time. And so um, one of the things we want to do is try to like push the implementation task force to start um, because we don't want to have six months to, uh, you know, have a facility built. It's not really enough time. What is the, um, I mean, it's not a budget neutral law, right? How expensive is it? That's a good question. <laughs> um, we had, we're not, this year, the budget only included money for capital. There's 110 million capital. In prior years, there were appropriations for the services in the out years, um, and this budget doesn't include that. Um, there are provisions related to how counties would be reimbursed, um, but Cuomo threw in some language related to compliance with the property tax cap, um, which New York City doesn't have. So it's actually unclear exactly how much the counties are gonna get. Um, part of the work we're gonna do is, in the coming year, really pushing for the counties to come up with what they need and then for the state to actually provide the funding. Because um, if we don't get the funding, um, the law is not going to be there. What is the $110 million supposed to include? It's just for building facilities. Um, we will need more facilities because the inc there'll be an increase in detention um, pre-trial throughout the state because the 16 and 17 year olds won't be able to be in jails. I mean, we think about Rikers. In some ways, the city is in the best place. Um, they have room at Crossroads and Horizons where the younger kids are. Maybe they need another facility. But upstate, counties don't all have their own detention facilities they share with each other. 
Um, and there are real issues around um, where these kids will go if they can't be in an adult jail. All right, uh, well, I want to take another chance to thank you all for being here and talking with us, and thanks everybody for coming. Thank you.